Hey, welcome back to Things Made Simple, where we take complex things and make them a little bit simpler. For the last two videos, we focused primarily on building this breadboard out with a YM3812 and programming it to play an F major seventh chord. But if we want to turn this into an actual instrument, we're going to need a more versatile way of controlling it. And so that's why today we're going to focus on the hardware and software associated with MIDI. And by the end of the episode, we'll be playing it with that keyboard over there. So let's get started. First off, what is MIDI anyway? Well, from a hardware perspective, MIDI is just a serial data connection, and it happens to send data at 31.25 kilobits per second. And of course, from a software perspective, there's like a whole protocol and like way that the data gets passed. But really, from a hardware perspective, it's pretty simple. Here, let's have a look. If you watched episode two of the series, this schematic should be pretty familiar. The only thing we've added is down here. This part takes the MIDI input and isolates it using a 6N138 optocoupler. And then it takes the output and sends it straight into the serial input of the microcontroller. To really understand how the circuit works, we need to pair it with a MIDI output circuit. And then you can see how the two connect with each other. On the left, we have the sender circuit. And on the right, we have the receiver. And in the middle, we have the MIDI cable. On the sender side, 5 volts flows through a 220 ohm resistor and then through the MIDI cable, through another 220 ohm resistor, through an LED that sits inside of the optocoupler, and then back through the cable to another 220 ohm resistor, and then into the TX pin of the microcontroller. Now when the TX pin goes high to 5 volts, then both ends of that connection are at 5 volts, and so no current can really flow through that wire. And because there's no current, the LED that sits inside of the opto-isolator doesn't turn on, and the connection between pins 5 and 6 gets broken. This means that the RX pin is going to connect through a 220 ohm pull-up resistor to 5 volts and provide a high output. When TX goes low, then the current starts to flow through the LED, and then this turns on the connection between pins 5 and 6 of the optocoupler, which then effectively shorts the RX pin to ground and generates a low output. Another thing that you might notice is that ground is only connected on one side of the MIDI connector. And that's because we want the ground to provide shielding for the wire, but we also want the circuits to stay fully isolated from each other in order to prevent any ground loops or any other issues. Okay, so now we know how the circuit works, let's build it. Hmm, looks like I'm running out of room here. Okay, let's add another breadboard. Okay, we'll drop in our 6N138 and connect VCC and ground. We can add a 220 ohm resistor and the diode and another resistor and connect the RX pin up to the microcontroller and a TRS jack for the MIDI input. And you know what guys, I've built this circuit so many times that I eventually just made a little circuit board with MIDI in and out circuits on it. And here it is all populated and the jacks are so much more solid this way. To hook it up, you just wire in five volts and ground and then you pop in the module and then you string the RX line over to the microcontroller, and then you can hook up a five pin DIN connector to the TRS jack using a conversion adapter. And uh, wait, what's the switch doing here? Okay, backing up for a second, you may be asking yourself, why am I using a TRS headphone jack instead of one of those traditional MIDI DIN connectors? And the answer is that DIN connectors and cables are pretty bulky and expensive. And there's a bunch of manufacturers that have already moved this direction as well. So when I built my first MIDI device, I bought a DIN to TRS adapter that was used by a bunch of big name brands like Korg and Akai. And uh, you know, it worked great in this configuration. Then one day I got a BeatStep Pro and I was delighted to see that it also had one of those TRS jack outputs for the MIDI and I hooked it up directly into my device. But it didn't work. And it turns out that Arturia swaps the ring and the tip connections. You see, there's no fully agreed upon way to convert between a MIDI DIN connector and a TRS jack, so there's a few variations. But now I had a mix of different kinds of adapters and devices, and so the easiest thing to do was just add a switch. Thankfully, you won't hear anything by inverting these two wires because the diode allows the current to flow backwards if you hook it up the wrong direction. Anyway, that's how this little breadboard module came to be. And I'll post all the files for this on GitHub if you want to order them from your favorite PCB fab house. 
Okay, let's continue with our MIDI journey and program this sucker. So in the last video, we used what looked like random numbers to play our F major 7th chord. But to play MIDI notes, we're going to have to make sense of those numbers so that we can map the MIDI notes to them. So let's start with how MIDI encodes the notes. The MIDI standard has 128 different notes, ranging from 0 to 127. So for example, middle C is C4, which is MIDI note 60. And actually, if you're familiar with the keyboard, the first note on the keyboard is A0, which is MIDI note 21, and the last key is C8, which is MIDI note 108. So MIDI actually supports even more notes than there are keys on the piano. Now, of course, each of these notes is tied to a frequency shown in the last column here, and we're going to use those frequencies to figure out how to instruct the YM3812 to play the notes. So the question is, how do we convert a frequency to the format that the sound chip needs? Well, to figure that out, we've got to go look at the data sheet. It turns out that there are two pieces of information that we need to set. One of them is a 3-bit number called block, and the other is a 10-bit number called F number. And down here, they give us some formulas that relate everything together. So you've got this variable called F sample, which is the sample rate, and you can get that by taking 3.6 megahertz, which is the master clock frequency, and dividing it by 72. Then these ones over here talk about phase increments, which honestly I don't totally understand, but if I'm guessing it has to do with the number of cycles to wait before changing the sample so that you can get the right frequency of wave. But honestly, none of that matters because we're going to use this formula down here, and this one tells us how to calculate an F number based on a frequency. They call that frequency uh, F muse, and we also need a sample frequency, which again is that master clock divided by 72, and a block number. Now they don't tell us which block number to use, but there's only eight of them, so maybe we can try them all and see which one works best. To do that, I built a tool that lets us calculate F numbers. Okay, so let's calculate the F number for all of the MIDI note frequencies using all of the block numbers. Okay, that's a lot of numbers. Now what? Well, there's one little wrinkle here. The F number is only a 10-bit number, and that means that the maximum value you can represent with it is 1023. So let's hide anything that's outside of that range. Okay, looks like there are a whole bunch of notes that we can't actually play. Well, that's okay. The highest note on the keyboard is C8, and the sound chip can go higher than that, so I think we'll be okay. Another thing that jumps out is that there's this repeating pattern of 970, 916, 864, and it shows up in the first column, and the next column, and the next column. And in fact, if we compare the note names, we can see that the pattern aligns to the same notes, just an octave lower. So in a way, the block value is kind of acting like an octave setting. But as you can see as we scroll down, you can actually represent the same frequency with multiple blocks. In fact, at the bottom, it looks like all eight blocks could create the note that we're looking for. Well, not so much, and in fact, there's kind of a clue here on the right. See how on the right, the same F number appears for both A sharp and B, or G sharp and A? And at the bottom, we're representing nine different notes with the same number. What's going on here? Well, the real issue is that the F number is actually an integer, so it doesn't have any decimal points. And when we go backwards and take these F numbers and then use them to recalculate the frequency, the frequency that we calculate may not be the one that we want. Here, let's try it. I called it the rounded frequency here, but this updated the table to show what the frequency would be if we calculated it using those integer F values for each block. And the color coding shows the level of error. And as you can see, if we scroll down, the amount of error increases significantly as we get lower, and also the higher the block number. How much error? Well, we can swap our calculation out, and we can see that error in terms of cents. Now, one cent is one one-hundredth of a semitone, or a semitone being a half step. Most of the errors at the top are pretty small, but as you get lower, some of these errors are multiple half steps off. But remember, A0 is the lowest note on the keyboard. If you've ever played a piano smaller than a, maybe a full grand, uh, that last note's going to sound a little wonky too. Okay, so what's the lesson in all of this? Basically, we want to use the smallest block number possible such that the F number stays within that 10-bit limit of 1024. Also, there's this repeating pattern that occurs that expresses each of the notes, 
And for some inexplicable reason, I like to put those in hexadecimal format, so I also came up with a visualization that converts them. Oh, and one more thing I forgot to mention. The datasheet calculates everything off a 3.6 megahertz clock, but technically our crystal oscillator is at 3.57954 megahertz. And so we can recalculate everything based off that new value. Does it make a difference? Yeah, a little bit. But you know, since we have them, let's use it. So let's take these F numbers over here on the left. They start at MIDI note 0 and go up to 30 for block 0, but those notes are going to repeat over and over and over. So let's just capture those and put them into an array, and then we can figure out how to map the MIDI notes to them. Okay, so here's our array, and if we use this with block 0, then the value AD is going to align with MIDI note 0. And then we can use this same array to align with a different set of notes, with each set being offset by 12 notes, which is one octave. Now, knowing that there's some overlap between the blocks, let's see if we can figure out a, maybe a general rule to determine which block to use and the index from our F number array that best represents the note. For the first 18 notes, we don't really have much choice. We really just have one block that we can use, which is block zero. But after MIDI note 18, a more general way of thinking about it is that we always want the block that uses the top 12 notes of its array, because those are the notes that are most in tune. We can use this formula to describe it. You start by subtracting 19, which is kind of like our starting offset. And then by dividing by 12, every incremental note that we add is going to add some fraction of 12, until we've added 12 notes. At that point, we'll have 12 over 12, which is a whole number. If we keep going, then we'll have 1 and another fraction of 12 until we've added 12 more notes, and then at which point we'll have 2 and a fraction of 12. And since this is integer math, the fraction part's just going to drop off, and that'll leave us with 0, 1, 2, etc., and it'll increment every 12 notes. This works great until you get to MIDI note 115, and at that point, the block number would be 8, which exceeds what we can represent using a 3-bit value. And this is why we can't represent any notes higher than 114. Okay, so that's the block number. Now how do we figure out the index of the frequency number array? Well, the first 18 MIDI notes use the first 18 numbers of our array. So we can just use the MIDI note as the index. And then after that, we want to rotate through the last 12 numbers of the array, which are indexes 19 through 30. And whenever I want to rotate through a set of numbers, my mind kind of jumps to the modulus operator. What's that? Well, if you think about counting to 10, you start at 0 and you count through 9. And then when you reach 10, the last digit flips from a 9 back to a 0. The same thing happens with the modulus operator, but you can decide where that flip occurs. In our case, we want it to happen at 12, so that when the number gets to 12, it flips back to 0. Here, let's just see what happens if we replace the division operator with the modulus operator. Okay, as you can see, this is close to what we want, but in this case, it's counting from 0 to 12 over and over. But what we really want is for it to count from 19 through 30. Well, that's easy enough. We just add 19, and then we should be good to go. Now, of course, for anything MIDI note 115 and higher, we're just going to ignore that. All right, so let's see what this looks like in code format. Well, somewhere in our .h file, we're going to have to define our frequency scale, uh, and that's going to include all of our f numbers. Then we can define our play note function, and that's going to take the channel that we want to play the note on and the MIDI note that we want to play. Okay, so let's start by turning the channel off, just in case there was a note playing on this channel already. Then, if our new note is too high, we can just quit the function, or if it's in that first set of 19 notes, then we can set the block to zero and then just choose the F number based on the MIDI note. And then in the most complicated case, we can use those two formulas that we just came up with to calculate the block and the index of the F number that we want to use. And now that we've set our frequency, we can just go ahead and turn the key back on. And that's all there is to it. That's all we have to do to play a MIDI note. So now all we have to do is take the signals that are coming in from the MIDI device and then use this function to play the note. Let's see how we do that. If you go out on GitHub, there's now a folder called Article 4, and that pairs with this video. To see what's changed, let's take a look at the ym3812.h file. First, I've added our frequency scale array, and that has all of those calculated values. 
Then a little further down, I added the definition for our play note function. And if you pop over the .cpp file, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom and see the implementation for that. It's really the same as we've talked about earlier, so there shouldn't be any surprises here. To add the MIDI functionality, let's go back to our .ino file. Now the first thing we need to do is ensure that the MIDI library is installed. So let's go to Tools, Manage Libraries. Now I would select Communication here because it turns out that MIDI is used in the middle of a whole lot of words, and you're going to get a ton of results if you just search for MIDI library. But go ahead and search for MIDI library now. And here it is. Now I've already installed this already, so I can just close the window, but just make sure you've installed it and everything should be good. Now to use the library, we have to include it at the top of our code. Next, we want to create an instance of the MIDI object. And now because we're using this AVR microcontroller that has multiple serial hardware ports, we have to specify which one we want to use. In this case, I'm using serial 2. Now let's go down to the setup function that gets run at the start of the program. We need to tell the MIDI library how to handle MIDI events. We do this by passing the name of a handler function to the library using this set handle note on function and set handle note off function. And we'll have to write these functions later. Now that this connection is defined, we can tell the MIDI library to start listening for MIDI events. Okay, now let's go down to the loop function. Of course, we're not going to need any of this old code here from the last program, uh, so we can just delete all of that. And instead, we're just going to instruct the MIDI library to read any incoming MIDI data. The zero here indicates that we're listening on all channels. Okay, now let's go back and write those handle note functions. These functions will receive a MIDI channel that the note is coming from, and a MIDI note number, and a velocity that the note was played at. Now we can just copy this same function definition for the note off function. It's going to work the same way. At this point, we've done basically all of the hard work. So all we need to do is instruct the processor to, here, let me grab the function, play a note. For now, we want it to play on channel 0. That's the YM3812 channel, not the MIDI channel. And then we just pass the note that we want to play, and we're good. OK, let's turn the note off. To do that, we use the reg key on function, and we use that to tell channel zero, that again, that's the YM3812 channel, to stop playing sound. Okay, let's send it up to the microcontroller. Okay, to test things out, I've connected the breadboard through the adapter and into a MIDI to USB device, and the audio is running into a capture device as well. So let's play a note and see what happens. Yeah, I think that sounds like a major scale and it seems generally in tune. Let's try playing something on the keyboard and see how responsive it feels. It definitely feels instantaneous, like there's no delay at all, but when you play a chord, like I'm doing here, eh, only one note comes out. And that's because we're only sending data to one channel of the YM3812. And actually, this is the problem that we're going to fix in the next video. We're going to make our module here polyphonic. Now there's a couple of ways that we can add polyphony, and we're going to explore those in the next video. But in the meantime, I think we can celebrate our success a little bit. I mean, we've got a YM3812. We've got MIDI functionality, and in my book, that kind of makes it an instrument, something that you can actually play. And sure, we'll add lots of other features to this that'll make it a better instrument, but I think we can kind of hang our hat on this one. So if you're following along, go check out the GitHub for all of the code, and then also my blog, thingsmadesimple.com, where I've got a little bit more of a write-up around the project. Um, and I'm also going to take the calculator that I use to calculate all the F numbers and put that online as well. That way, if you get a crystal that has a slightly different frequency, or maybe you want to overclock the YM3812, you can at least keep it in tune. Although if you do overclock it, I'd love to hear about it. Definitely leave a comment about that in the comments section below. I'd be super interested to hear about it. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for watching. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up leave a comment, subscribe, all that good youtube -y stuff. My name is Tyler, and we'll see you next time on Things Made Simple.